Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, so I'm going to talk about Calliope, about the Calliope modeling software, and about the European energy system models that we build with this software and how we'll use that in the Pathfinder project. So let's jump right in. And I want to start by differentiating two things, Calliope and EuroCalliope. So Calliope is a tool to build energy system models, um, which initially I, I developed during my PhD at the Imperial College London, and is now a, a multi-institution open source software project. And then we have EuroCalliope. EuroCalliope is a set of data and workflows to build models of the European energy system um, using the Calliope software. EuroCalliope was initially developed um, by Tim Trendle during his PhD actually at ETH, um, and it's being further developed in several projects, which includes Pathfinder, as we'll see later. And I wanna jump right in with an example application to illustrate a little bit what kind of um, things we can do um, with these two tools. This is from a study from last year, um, um, also coming from the PhD thesis of Tim Trendle. And here we first run an electricity system model to design a continent scale renewable electricity system for Europe. Now, of course, this is a cost minimizing model. So it uses the best possible locations for wind and PV. This means that generation relative to demand is much above one in some areas, but it's much below one in many others because the model places um, the renewable generation capacity where the renewable resource is optimal. Of course, this continent scale system requires a lot more transmission capacity than we have in today's power system. Now, what if we don't want that? Well, we can add a constraint to the model um, to say that each region must supply itself with renewable electricity on average over a full year. So that works as well. And as you can see in the bottom map, most places now in this small result generate exactly as much as their demand over the year on average, um, with the exception that some places still generate a little bit more than their demand. And that's for model internal reasons. For example, we assume that large hydropower plants in, in the Alps um, exist anyway, even if they're not needed for that uh, specific local area. And we can explore these kinds of trade-offs in a systematic way. We can start with the again, with the continental system, everything is fully interconnected. So renewable generation doesn't have to be where demand for electricity is. And we're concerned with how the total system cost changes. So we'll just not look at absolute costs, uh, but at relative changes to the cost. So this, this initial case is 100%. I can now say, okay, countries have to be self-sufficient on average over the year. And that means cost goes up slightly. I can tighten this constraint and say, regions have to be self-sufficient. So not just the country, but the, the small regions within the country. On average over the year, again, this increases system cost. And I can make this even stricter. I can say actually countries are cut off from each other entirely. We cut all the yellow lines here on this, on this map. Um, so they don't just have to supply themselves on average, but in every single hour of the year. And I can tighten that further to say, not just the countries, but actually every individual region within a country is completely cut off from its neighbors. That's just cost. We can then look at other things um, that we care about. Balancing capacity, for example, summarizes here the amount of storage, hydro, um, and dispatchable biomass uh, fired generation. Can look at transmission capacity. Of course, transmission capacity goes down uh, the more we cut things off um, from each other. And this is a stylized uh, model, but it allows us to navigate um, and look at trade-offs. And I can say, well, okay, maybe I'm happy to have somewhat higher cost for regions to be self-sufficient on average, um, but in return, that gets me slightly reduced transmission needs. And this is, um, this is a model um, that was built with Calliope. Um, and the key thing I want to highlight here is that this model was purpose-built to solve a particular question. So because 
This question was around the self-sufficiency of political units. Um, the spatial layout of the model um, follows political boundaries. The spatial layout of the grid here is highly stylized. It follows the political boundaries rather than the physically existing uh, transmission system. And we only model those technologies that were actually needed to really look at um, this um, self-sufficiency of political units question. And the whole thing, code and data, is available online um, under open licenses. And so because we're here to, to really look at, talk about Calliope um, and your Calliope, we're gonna um, go into a bit more detail what, what, these, what these two things actually are. So the Calliope software itself, here are a couple of headline features. Um, and I'll just give you some time to read through this. There's no point uh, in me just reading this out. And you have the website link here if you want to find out more. The typical inputs and outputs that you get from a Calliope model are summarized here. We provide things like the model regions or the locations, the possible connections between them, time series for demand, for renewable generation, um, the technologies that are available, including their performance parameters, their costs, constraints on where these technologies can be placed, um, more general policy constraints like, for example, emissions targets or renewable, uh, minimum renewable share targets, um, and, and many more. And then Calliope takes, takes all of this, turns it into a giant optimization problem, decides on where to place technologies, um, it gives us the investment um, and the variable costs for those technologies, emissions. It then decides how to operate these technologies on an hour by hour basis or, or whatever time resolution we're using, how energy is, is transported or transmitted uh, from, location, from one location to other storage levels, consumed resources, and so on and so forth. And then we derive additional outputs like capacity factors um, or levelized costs after the model has solved. So that's a kind of um, um, that that's kind of the basic setup of of what um, Calliope, the Calliope software, does. Now let's look at the second part here, which is um, uh, really what we're particularly interested in today: the Euro Calliope workflow. So this thing down here, and this is how these two pieces fit together. If we look at the bottom part first here. Um, we call your Calliope a workflow. It's a set of automated data processing code packaged together with the necessary data and assumptions to build models like the European model that I just described. And what your Calliope ultimately produces is a set of text files and data tables, which, which are the model that we use, that we set up to answer a specific question, like this question of self-sufficiency um, and, and trade-offs uh, between different uh, levels of self-sufficiency that we just talked about. And then we feed those files into Calliope. Calliope builds a mathematical model, um, optimizes that and spits out results. Now, what, what does this model look like? What is the user interface here? The user interface we use is basically um, the text files themselves. Um, the whole thing is set up so that these are human readable. This is an example of, of the definition of one technology combined cycle gas power plant. Um, and you can see that um, it's, it's, you know, there, there's some degree of human readability here. You can look at these files and understand what's going on. You can modify them um, relatively easily. Um, we do this particularly because we run these models on high performance computers a lot, um, where having text files only as input is actually an advantage because we can automate this on, on the high performance computers. Um, but if you say, well, this is actually, this is quite confusing and I don't really want to work with, with uh, text files like this. Um, NREL, the US National Renewable Energy Laboratory has built um, an open source web-based user interface. Um, you can see that at this web link here, um, which 
basically makes this process a whole lot more pleasant by giving you a nice uh, point and click interface to build and to modify um, Calliope models. But we don't really use this web interface ourselves, uh, again, because we mostly rely on running these models uh, directly on high performance computers. So coming back to your Calliope, um, the main issue so far is I've just been talking about electricity. Um, but of course, we want to go beyond electricity. Um, and that's what we're doing right now. And we're mostly done. Funded primarily by the Sentinel project, which is a Ryzen 2020 project, um, with work done mostly by Bryn Pickering, a postdoc. Um, we extended um, on the work of Tim Turnle. Um, and we now cover heating, transportation, um, as well as industry processes. Um, and we're, we've, um, we've also expanded the uh, spatial configurations that are possible um, so that we can actually examine um, not just um, at the level of political units, but, but also actually consider the current and future structure of the electricity transmission grid. So um, this, is, um, this, this work is already done. Um, and is what we'll base further work in the Pathfinder project on. We're using this right now, this, this Euro Calliope 2.0 workflow, the fully sector coupled one um, in a couple of projects. One example here on the left, uh, what we call the Euro spores model. Um, here we're using the spores method, which was um, developed by, by another postdoc, Francesco Lombardi. Um, this method generates many spatially diverse energy system configurations, and we're applying that to Europe right now. You can find out more about this method in, in this paper that's referenced down here. Another example is the PhD project of Fei Wu. She's um, developing a model called Abby, which is going to home in on the strategic roles of bioenergy in particular in this future European energy system. And this is again just to highlight that Eurocalipi and Eurocalipi 2.0 in this case um, is a workflow to build models with. Then we use this to build a model to, to look at a particular problem. Um, and these are just two examples of such models or such problems. So to summarize, we have two tools here we have Calliope, we have Eurocalipi. Calliope is a tool to build energy system models. Um, and Eurocalipi is a workflow to process data um, for use with Calliope. And Eurocalipi currently exists in two major versions, the sort of version one, which is electricity only, and the version two, which is the full energy system version. Okay, so how, what, you know, how does this, um, you know, what, what, what are we going to do with this? Why is this in Pathfinder? Well, in, in the Pathfinder project, um, this is going to be used in work package one in particular. Um, and when you use it to assess pathways for Switzerland within the context of decisions taken Europe wide. So we're going to model all of Europe um, because Switzerland is just a small part of that and look at what um, that means for Switzerland and make the connection to Switzerland. We'll be making improvements to the workflow, uh, like better representing existing infrastructure, gas infrastructure, um, adding in role of, of new technologies like CCS or other negative emissions technologies. And one, one, one important aspect of this is that it will provide, uh, besides providing results um, in its own right, it will also provide boundary conditions for the much more detailed modeling of the Swiss energy system um, in the Pathfinder project that will happen with the Nexus E model. Um, so that's a very important link between um, Eurocalipi or Calliope um, and Nexus E. Um, and, and we also want to explore whether we can integrate any of the more detailed operational constraints um, that are coming out of some of the other modeling work. For example, the eHub. Um, or the remap uh, models, um, and whether we can make use of, of that more detailed information 
um, in our more aggregated view um, of the European and Swiss system. Okay. Um, very briefly on validation and calibration, because we're primarily doing normative modeling of possible futures, you can't really validate the final output of the models themselves. But what we can do and what we, what we do um, is to validate um, and really check the input data. For example, ensuring that the renewable generation data that we use is as accurate as possible. And what we also have is we have extensive automated tests to ensure that the Calliope software itself does what we think it does. So, for example, small test models that ensure that the mathematical formulation of our constraints is correct. And these tests run in an automated way every time we make changes to the code. So with this automated testing, we, we can be fairly confident that um, the model is doing exactly what we think um, it's doing. And I think this is actually an important um, additional feature of Calliope. So of course there are many limitations. First of all, the method itself has many limitations. We're using usually cost minimizing, although we can minimize for other things as well, linear or mixed integer optimization. We feed a range of assumptions into this optimization. And, and these assumptions may or not be correct, whatever correct means. So as a user, one must always be aware um, of, of this. And there's really no way, way around this. On a more technical level, um, it currently requires quite some technical flair to operate uh, these tools, both Calliope um, and especially also the Euro Calliope workflow. Um, third parties have come in here, like this NREL graphical user interface, um, but we're also working on improving accessibility um, ourselves, in particular making the Euro Calliope workflow easier to use. And finally, I've already mentioned this, um, usually at the moment, um, we, we just have computational challenges. If we really want to go into high resolution in space and time, run a large range of scenarios, um, we usually end up on a high performance cluster, you know, basically on a supercomputer. Um, we are working on, on model formulation and algorithm improvements here um, to reduce the computational needs so that we can bring more types of models into the reach of people that don't have access to supercomputers, um, but um, this will always remain um, a challenge. So Calliope itself is used by a wide range of people because it's freely downloadable. We, we're not really aware of who all these people are, but we do know that it's used in many universities uh, worldwide, as well as in major energy companies and engineering firms. Your Calliope, on the other hand, as far as we know right now, is only used by ourselves. Uh, we think it could be useful for various other people, um, but we have to do a better job of documenting it and making it easier to use first, I think. So stay tuned until uh, later this year when, when that work is done. Finally, licenses. Um, pretty much everything um, is available under one or another open source license. Both Eurocalliope and Calliope are completely free and open. Um, we try to use input data that is also open uh, with, with very few exceptions, um, which allows us to then also make the final models that we build with these workflows available under open licenses. As you see here, the example, again, from the Trundle et al. study that I showed at the start, um, which is available here on Zenodo as a fully um, packaged up and ready to use Calliope model. Um, and that's really it. A short overview and introduction to Calliope and your Calliope. Um, both of these you can find more information about online. Um, and if you come back to the your Calliope link, a bit later in autumn, uh, you'll find um, a lot more documentation um, than is currently there right now, um, but there is some amount of documentation to help people get up and running already. Okay, and that's